Welcome to the Toffee Blues, your source for all things Everton. I'm here with Simon Hart today, who's writing this, who's written this fantastic book about Everton in the 1980s. Here we go, it's called Everton in the 1980s, the player's stories. And he's gone around and interviewed some of the um, some of the main figures, but also some of the peripheral figures of that team in the 80s. Now, now uh, it's, it's, it's a fantastic book, but with me being a young man, I, I wasn't obviously there in the 80s, but I just enjoyed it anyway, because... I've been, I've learned that one that one to eleven team from the from the successful eighties period, as I learned the alphabet as young as that. But I didn't know the stories behind them, and Sam was Sam was being able to record those stories, and it's just fantastic kind of bringing it to life. So uh, that's a little bit about the book. Uh, Simon, could you tell us a little bit more about this book? Yeah, no, thanks for that, and thanks for having me having me on. Sorry. Um, yeah, we um, the, the book began in uh, two thousand and fifteen. Um, I had a conversation with James Corbett, who is the man behind the Cooperton books, uh, a you know local Liverpool-based uh, publisher, and um, Simon Hughes, who was working with us. Simon had written books about uh, Liverpool in the the eighties and nineties, uh, Red Machine, Men in White Suits, um, and I liked the premise of Simon's books, whereby he didn't just speak to the sorry to talk about Liverpool FC, you know, straight off. But, <laughs> Um, just a bit of a preamble, you know, Simon, um, he, he didn't just speak to the big names from those areas. He spoke to, as you mentioned, some of the peripheral figures, some of the unsung heroes. And I always found that interesting about his books. Um, so when I set out with my book, um, you know, I thought, I'll try and speak to Kevin Ratcliffe, to Neville Southall, um, you know, to, to Gary Lineker, some, you know, some of the big names from the area, but also try and speak to people who, who Evertonians haven't heard from. You know, so, for example, um, Graham Sharp, who is, such, is still such a vis- visible person at the club. Um, I didn't speak to Sharp. I went and spoke to Paul Wilkinson, who, um, you know, just came in and played a cameo role, but he, he actually scored winning goals against and for Everton in the same season at, at, uh, at Goodison in 84-85. Um, so that was the idea, you know, speak to people like Wilkinson, speak to Kevin Richardson, who, you know, was such a, a brilliant um player deputising for Sheedy coming in, you know, doing a job um, and then he went off and won the league with Arsenal as well um, people like, I'm just thinking um, Paul Power who was the echo player of the season for Everton in the second title winner season of 87 who, you know, came from Man City when he was 32 um, Van den Haar wasn't available um, at the season began and he actually came in and played about 40 games um, nobody expected that, he didn't expect it um, but he walked away, you know, with the league championship medal. Um, so that that's the idea of the book, anyway, just to collect a lot of stories, to speak to some of the, you know, the big names, the obvious heroes, but then to get some of the lesser told tales. Yeah, it was. It's, it's a great idea, but like, kind of how, how how difficult was it to get hold of some of these names? Because you've obviously um, got some great characters out there, and some of the, as you say, a lot of the stories have already, already been told. The likes of Graham Sharp reel it off all the time, but these untold stories are maybe the ones that kind of the best stories, the hidden gems that haven't come out there and obviously you've brought these out and um, was it difficult to get in touch with these peripheral figures as we say those those players who kind of haven't had their stories told as much was it difficult to get in touch with them? Um, yes and no I mean in, in, in somebody like Paul Bauer um, who lives in France now I mean he he was possibly the easiest I mean I had to go and fly over to Carcassonne and he put me up in his house and uh I, you know, saw this treasure trove of all old memorabilia he has, which is great. He was he was good as gold, really. Um, other people, I mean, Gary Lineker, you know, who hadn't really spoken much about, or he doesn't really speak much about his time at Everton. He, um, that wasn't so easy, you know, sending emails to an agent, hoping, you know, rather than expecting to get a reply. But, um, you know, in the end, I got an invitation to, to, to BBC one evening uh, before match of the day. Um, in fact, it was the evening... Um, it began very badly because Everton, you know, they were winning 3-1 at Chelsea or 2-0 and then 3-2 at Chelsea when Funes Mori scored um, <laughs> in extra time, in, in injury time. And then they, they equalised after about 200 minutes through a John Terry offside goal. Um, so I was, I was at the BBC that day watching them prepare for match of the day and then Lineker came out and I had about 40 minutes with him, um, which was great, you know, to just to hear him talk about that time. Um Thinking some of the harder ones, um, Pat Van den Howe, you know, really wasn't sure what, what I was going to get there because you know, we've all heard stories about, you know, Psycho Pat and just what was he going to be like, but, you know, he, he was great um, and incredibly candid, 
in his uh, storytelling, um, thankfully for me. Um, I mean, there's always people that get away, you know, you have a wish list when you start a book and, you know, some people come off, others don't. I mean, Peter Reid would have been fantastic for a chapter, but uh, at the time he was doing his own book. Um, so in the end, I just managed to get him to do the foreword. Um, so yeah, you know, I mean, Adrian Heath, who who was working, is, is still working in the States. Um, he, um, I, I had to wait for him to come back at the end of his season, managing, you know, the MLS. Um, and he was great. You know, people say don't meet your heroes, but I mean, he was my hero. And, he, he couldn't be a great enthusiast about Everton, you know, great storyteller, still loves the club, and you just walk away, you know, feeling <laughs> ten foot tall when when you see somebody like that. Um, so no, it was it was it was it was a, it was a privilege. I mean, double edged as well because you, if this is a book about your your boyhood heroes, you want to do them justice. You know, your friends are going to read it too, and you want to do a book, that, you know, that they'll enjoy. So. You know, so exciting, a bit nerve-wracking, but I think we got there in the end. Yeah, you got the best out of them as well. They, they certainly told you a lot of stories. Um, I, I like the Pat pa Van Den Howe chapter. I like how he kind of speaks... I think you said um, in, in the Pat Van Den Howe chapter, he kind of speaks in one section a bit like punches. Like, he kind of just... He's very short and to the point, and some of those some of those stories we've heard and some of the stories were just fantastic about when he goes missing and things like that. It's, it's just really entertaining, but... Um, I kind of when you spoke to these players, you might you must have known like a lot of the information already. But what did you learn from them that that you didn't know already know? Um, I mean, I I didn't. I mean, I suppose I didn't realise just what a, a naughty boy Pavan and how been. I mean, you you got a real sense of of how much they actually. Um, I mean, I, I, I don't think I'm exaggerating how much they actually loved each other as a group and you know loved that time together. Um, when they won the cup in in eighty four, um, seven of that team were twenty three or younger. So, so really, they they they'd grown up together. They were they were they had, I think they actually liked each other. You know, they weren't just footballers doing a job. So there's a real tightness there that really came through. Um, what what else did I learn? Um, I mean, little things like uh, Derek Malfield. You know who. He, he didn't really get involved in the, in the social side and, you know, he reflected on, on that maybe he, if he had to do it again, he would be more involved, but he, he had epilepsy, um, which um, he'd never really spoken about before. And, you know, I, I don't think to be in that, admittedly, they, they had a real bond, but it's still, you know, a very competitive world. And to, to have someone like epilepsy in a football dressing room, you know, I imagine kind of being easy for him. Um, which is why he avoided discos with the bright lights. Um, some of the pranks, you know, um, were, I'm not sure how much I, I, we should be disclosing here, but you know, things like Adrian Heath leaving a turd in John Lee's <laughs> toilet bag, you know, I didn't know that. Uh, things like um, just how, you know, compared to today where footballers have everything, you know, the fact that they, they only had one kit and one set of kit for a whole season. And uh, there were only about three or four pairs of shorts, which, you know, gave somebody ample uh, space for uh, all the various parts. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, Kevin Ratcliffe, you know, he'd, he'd get to be a scramble with three or four or five players before a game, some of the bigger players, um, you know, to actually get the shorts where they feel comfortable in. And he, he was saying that he had a terrible first half in the Cup semi-final in 84 against Southampton. And um, he went in at half-time complaining about it. And basically it was his shorts, his shorts were too tight. <laughs> Peter Reed just pulled his own pair off and shook them a Ratcliffe and said, you know, you get on with it. So things like that, you know, these lovely little details which just don't happen today. Yeah. It sounds like a family, as you said. It, it sounds like a real what Howard and and Colin Harvey created at the club was a real family atmosphere and that was what they all they all bounced off each other and it, it was one massive team together. They used to all go out and drink together and and um I think some of the earlier players that you you talk, you talk to in the book, um I kind of encapsulate that family feel, but then you do mention the players you came in later and couldn't fit in, um, and then obviously you, you talk to one or two of them later in the book as well. People like Pat Nevin. Um, how was it speaking to him? Who just kind of didn't didn't get in on that? Was it was it kind of interesting to see his perspective perspective on, on things as well? Yeah, um, I mean I can sort of see both sides because um, you know if you. If you grow up with a group of people and you all really work for each other and you you know you do everything together, of course it's going to be 
strange when other people come into that, you know, to that group. Um, for example, Graham Sharp, I don't think he particularly liked Tony Cotty. Um, if you think about it, he, he and Adrian Heath have been at the club since they were 20, 21. They'd learned to play together and, and Adrian Heath was a really hard working player, you know, and they, they, they linked up together, they worked off each other. And then Cotty comes in, who's basically just a, a goal scorer and probably, you know, for Sharpie, he was quite a selfish player. So you can see from his point of view why, you know, um, it wasn't going to work. Um, and then Cotty doesn't drink in the same pub as the rest of the team, which sounds petty to us. But, you know, if you're putting your, your, your body on the line every you know, weekend with a group of people, I suppose you want that, you know, that all for one, one for allness. Um, Nevin, his case, um, you know, he, I think he's somebody who, who he tried to just go on with everybody without actually being part of a group because, um, he, he, you know, he is an individual. He, he, he would go off and, I don't know, go to a museum when everybody else was in the pub, when they went on, on tour. Um, so he, he, he struggled because um, he, he was actually, in the, in the context of today's football, you know, he's being very professional. He wouldn't, he wouldn't drink. He was very serious. He'd do extra work, fitness work. But I think Howard Kendall saw quite differently and, and Kendall just, I don't think, really liked him. No, that's that's the perception Nevin, Nevin gave me. Um, so ne- Nevin was was an observer and he's, you know, he's, he's an intelligent fellow and he gave just a really interesting perspective on on why somebody like Martin Keown was, was hated, I think, by, by everybody else because Keown socially was quite awkward then, you know, he said. Um, whereas Nevin wasn't awkward, Nevin was just a bit his own man. And Neville Southall too, you know, Neville who has this reputation for being a bit different, maybe awkward. I think Nev, who I got to know on the back of this book, you know, thankfully he's just somebody who's really, he spoke his mind, he was honest, um, he oh, he wasn't a company man, you know, he, he would do his own thing, but he, he's, he was also, um, you know, a consummate professional. Um, so th- it's fascinating just getting different perspectives on on, you know, why things work and why they don't work at the same time. Yeah, he's a passionate guy. It was it was interesting to see kind of Pat's story that was kind of from the inside but from the outside at the same time. So it was interesting things like that. But I think a big part of I'm not sure if it was a big part of Everton's success, but definitely in the team building was that drinking culture going out together, having a good time, and getting on the ale, which you can't do nowadays in the, in, in in this. But obviously, it's a completely I think it's a different sport nowadays compared to what it was then. But do you think you can still create that kind of team spirit that can go on and win things nowadays with the completely different? Do you think that we Everton could re- potentially recreate that nowadays? Um, you know, I asked Adrian Heath this because, of course, he's you know he's still he's the only one still managing. You know, he's at uh, Minnesota United now, um, and he he said you know you ju- you try and do it in different ways. You take you take players out. I don't know karting or. Or, you know, to do different things. It doesn't involve, you know, just just drinking. Um, I don't think it ever just involved drinking. Um, it, you know, they 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 had a tightness. Um, it helps to win, of course. Um, I mean, I'm just sorry to go back to uh, to our neighbours, Liverpool, but I, I was working at the, the Nations League um, a couple of weeks back in Portugal, and I was in the um, the Flash TV area where the post match interviews happen. And uh, this was just after you know, Holland had beaten England uh, after extra time in the semi-final. And uh, Van Dijk came out of the dressing room and spent at least 20, 20, 25 minutes just chatting outside the England one with uh, Henderson, Trent, Trent Alexander-Arnold and Gomez. And you could just see this real tightness. And you know, they, all they wanted to do was be together and to talk about what had just happened. <coughs> In that you know that unhappy evening in uh, in Madrid, <laughs> but they, they they were just you just saw this group of young people you know just wanted to share something together and you know it, it, I did feel pretty you know as an Evertonian pretty envious really seeing that that, that bond they had um, mm-hmm. so it, I think it can still it can still happen um, obviously you have different nationalities now um, in dressing rooms um, it, top players are almost like mini industries in a sense that. You know they've got their advisors. They've even got sometimes their own medical people. Um, so things are, are different. But if 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 I'm, I don't, but I don't want to, you know, to sound like a, a cynical old fart saying you know things aren't as they used to be. They're just different. Yeah. And uh, you know if you're a good manager, you, you try and create something. Whether um, I don't know whether kind of Richard or something's leaving. Uh, I don't know a turd in Lucas Dean is a. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I can't see that happening now. I think, uh, as, as you say, though, to create like, a team spirit, a manager is a big part of that. And unfortunately, across the party, do have one of the best managers in the game. And um, you never know when, whether Marco Silva can recreate something like that. Um, I'm not sure, but you never know. It um, remains to be seen. But not just the relationship between the players as well. I think, uh, as you mentioned in the book, with one of the statistics about uh, the wage, the gap in the... Um, the comparison of wages between fans and players was, I think it was 40% um, of, I think a fan was earning about 40% of what a player was earning back then in the 80s, but now it's down to something like 2%. So obviously there's been a distance created between the players and the fans, and that's evolved our game massively as well. Do you think that affects the, uh, the, the potential recreation of what, 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 what we had in the 80s as well? Um. If you ask the Liverpool fans, do they feel close to this team? They'll probably tell us yes, sadly. Uh, but you know, from, from an, I do think it, it doesn't help. Um, do players really understand, or players understand the culture of the club that they they're playing for? Um, I mean, I'm not. I mean, I, I watched Richarlison, you know, last season and. Uh, you know a lot of the, the way that he would go down so easily and yeah. I, don't, I really don't think Everton, Everton fans like that um, and I wondered if you know why doesn't somebody at Everton I don't know show him a video of Tim Cahill um, and you know say that actually you know people, the fans at this club don't really want to see you run around like Neymar every you know five minutes um, so I think that's something whether where they, they can get you know what the culture of the club is um, ironically, when everyone's got you know bloody DNA, and that's all people talk about. <laughs> but um, but yeah, um, it's a question. Do do they? I mean, different languages, different um, nationalities, and also um, you know these things. Um, you know, yeah. Animals, you know, we, we complain about you know players being distant, but I think if you you're going to be wary as a, as, a, as a high profile footballer if every time you go out, you know, people stick. You know, a phone, in, a phone in your face. That can't be easy for for them. Um, you know, the, in in mitigation for for this gap that's that's grown. Yeah, I think it, like, even in the case of like Jordan Pickford in the in the, in the the what happened recently as well. Like he's a proper in my eyes. He's a kind of uh, he's head of his head of his time. He was kind of like an old fashioned footballer, and he would have fitted in straight in back to, back in those days, going out the drinking culture because he's still got that nowadays. But he's kind of being faced with these limits. And being like goaded, put like in public just to get a reaction, so someone can film it, and then he's be that's affecting him as well because he was obviously worn by the club on the back of that. So it it, it that, that even specific example shows the differences of what they could get away with back in the day and what they can nowadays. But um, it just reading the going back to the book, it just kind of reading that just kind of established the identity of Everton. And now um, the identity of Everton have survived. Um, kind of beyond that, I, th- I do think, and I, th- I do think David Moyes even kept some of that during his reign. But the way um, people saying that Everton had lost their identity in the last few years, because looking looking back in the book in the eighties, it was kind of like Everton had their specific identity, and we're going to stick to that forever. And that was what made our club, and that was what made us successful. Um, but do you think we've lost that in the last few years? And do you think we can we can go back to that at any point, or do you think that's gone now? With the, as we've been talking about the changing of the game. Um. Yeah, I think Everson's identity, you, you could say, has, has has always shifted. You know, um, in the in the sixties, uh, with you know, with with the money of of John Moores with Catterick, um, you know, they were successful teams, but I, I don't know whether they were appreciated because you know, Catterick wasn't the kind of warm person that the Kendall was in terms of a relationship with his players or the press. Um, and Everton, in some respects, were seen as you know the you know the big spenders who bought success. Uh, whereas in, in the 80s, you know they didn't really buy success; they built success. Um, you know, brought players through, made a couple of big gamble in signings with uh, Reed and Gray that paid off. Um, so that, te- that they had a different identity to the the 60s team. Uh, the, the identity has changed in the sense that you know if Everton were always. I don't know the Arsenal of the North, you know, a kind of establishment team, you know, a, a kind of old money of football, um, and now we're seen as, you know, by many people as a mid-table team, you know, on, on a level of of Leicester or somebody, God forbid. Although I say that they won the league three years ago, um, but you know, the, the identity has shifted. You know, the book 
my book ends, you know, at the end of the 80s um, with people like Neville South or Pandevin sort of talking about where it goes wrong. I think they were unlucky in that, or not unlucky, you know, but they, with John Moore sort of reaching the end of his life and and the club lacking uh, a sense of purpose, really, at the start of the 90s, just as the money started to come in. So you had a that period with no ambition, really, just as other clubs were really wising up to the fact football had become, you know, business, and you had to invest, um, which Everton didn't do with the park stand, park end stand, for example. Um, so yeah, the, I mean, I'm always arguing with people um, with, with my work. I, you know, I'm often meeting people from other countries who sort of think Everton are kind of this kind of little brother of Liverpool FC. <laughs> And I, 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 I'm, 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 a, I'm a bore, really. You know, I go on. Well, actually, you know, we're, we're, we're an aristocrat of English football. We've done this, that, and the other. But sadly, it's a long time ago, most of it. Um, and, you know, so what is the identity now? Um, the Moyes identity is, as you referred to, is probably what a lot of people today think is Everton. Um, and it, I, I've been disappointed that, that they, you know, that's drifted in the last couple of years. Um, thankfully, at the end of the last season, you know, Goodison felt a bit like it used to. Um, but, you know, hopefully they can build on that now. Yeah, the introduction of the siren. I'm not sure if they had that in the 80s, but, um, yeah, so what do you think What do you think the Everton identity is, really, um, over the years? And, and do, you think, do you think we can kind of recreate that? What, what would we have to recreate to, to kind of get that back? Um, I think, all, if you look back at all the... The, you know the good Everton, the great Everton teams, even since the the sixties. Um, I mean, I, I can't you know go further back because at least in the sixties we, we we've heard stories and you know, seen videos. But they've all they've all worked for each other. They've all been hard working teams. They've all got stuck in when they've had to. They've all played football when they could. You know they've they've made it difficult for people at Goodison. Um, I mean, for me that's that's the thing. Um, you know, if if I think about the '80s team, they could play football, but they could also they could also battle. You know, um, the '95 team, which won the FA Cup, not a great Everton team, but a good, very good Everton team. And again, you know, nobody wanted to come to Goodison because they would, you know, they they put their foot in, they get stuck in, they played a high tempo, they'd they'd work for each other. Um, and you know this David Moyes' Everton that was all about you know a team, you know play, unselfish players, um, you know thankfully Carsley, but other people like um, you know Leon Osman, um, a team player, um, Bain's a team player, you know the, Phil Neville, you know a good captain bringing people together, but they they played in a way that made it difficult to Goodison. I've spoken to um, you know former referees. Um, I remember, I think it was uh, Howard Webb and Mike Riley um, just telling me how they loved Goodison, but it was also probably the hardest stadium to go to, um, just because of that tightness. And when Everton get in, you know, the, the the faces of the opposition when they get that tempo going, and that did, we did lose that bit. Um, and you know, there were some home performances last year towards the end of the season where you began to think maybe it's coming back. I always remember. Um, and the Hinchcliffe telling me um, when Martinez was appointed that he just shook his head and said, you know, this this won't work because the Everton crowd demands a few things, and one of them is that high tempo. And with with Martinez, he he could see that you know that that slow build up, you know, the sideways passing was it wasn't long term, it wasn't going to work for Everton, and you know he was right. Um, so I think that's what that's what an Everton identity would be, um, even if you know th- things shift and, and the club's you know fortunes ebb and flow, um, or or mainly sort of uh, I'd like to say go up and down. There have been too many ups recently, but you know what I mean. Um, so I'd say that um, hard working uh, together in your face um, yes. and a bit of good football too. Yeah, it's kind of eleven eleven team players who work together and fighters as well kind of something the crowd can relate to so kind of an old fashioned style I'd say in a way um, some, but obviously get that quality in there as well kind of majestic that's what um, I was listening to the I Am Alan Myers podcast which is brilliant which the Liverpool Echo like, oh, have been doing at the moment I'm not sure if you've uh, you've given that a listen but the last one they were saying about um, how uh, Preno, I think it was Dave Prentice saying how he thinks Andre Gomez is a classic Everton player in the way that he's a majestic kind of 
midfielder who is who's a team player. So hopefully we can recreate that. But do you think we do you think we will be able to recreate that in the in the near future at Everton? Well, I mean Silver, I don't I don't know too much about him. He doesn't seem to be a slave to philosophy. Um, and sorry to be cynical about the philosophy word, but um, maybe we heard too much of it. Um, under Martinez, who of course is a very good manager in in certain respects, um, and somebody who cared about the club, but um, I think in, in in you know it's very hard to reinvent the wheel. And it, with an Everton team, I think you want a team who's just going to work hard for each other. And we saw that the thing of the Arsenal home game; they're all getting stuck in. They're playing with pace and quality. Um, you know, technical footballers as well. People like you. Know, obviously, I think. Of, of Bernard, um, you know, but you know, Richarlison's a, a skillful player, fast. Um, th- there is skill in that team as well. Um, so hopefully, um, hopefully we can uh, we, we can, you know, talk about you know teams hating coming back to Goodison again. Bain, Leighton Baines has said that he felt that had been lost, but that, that's what we want. Um, in, and you know, dare I say, you know, Liverpool have done that. They've what are they playing? You know, high tempo in your face football, uh, which I'd like to remind them that uh, Colin Harvey uh, brought that to Merseyside in the eighties, um, famously. Um, you know, wanting to, uh, to to get in, you know, to get to, to be offensive in, in winning the ball rather than uh, reactive. You know, to be proactive. Um, so I know they talk about gag and pressing, but uh, you know, Colin was there first. Yeah, Harvey pressing. <laughs> Never mind, gag and pressing. It was it was us first. Everything everything Liverpool have done, we did first. So, uh, apart from winning the European Cup, unfortunately, but well, we did not the European Cup, but we have won Cup Winners Cup, which is one of the things that's covered in the book anyway. But uh, yeah, we're, we're we're the originals of of, of Merseyside, and uh, you can you can certainly say that about the pressing game as well, as is covered in the book. Right. So obviously, in that eighties team as well, we had a lot of young players coming through. The average age was. What twenty three under twenty three something like that was a lot of blossoming young players coming through. Um, do you think there's any players in the current Everton team that could blossom through similarly to the to those of, of those of that squad in the eighties? Um, well, a lot of people will will talk about Richarlison. I mean, last season for me, um, the the player whose kind of development I, I find exciting was Calvin Lewin. Um, because I remember people would 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 say, oh, he's not good enough. He, you know. When really we, we hadn't seen him, him play every week, and it was for me it was just intriguing to see it and encouraging to see the way that you know by giving a young player eight, nine, ten successive starts in the Premier League, just how how much confidence he could he could gain, and you know you, you get to know your teammates, you get to know the patterns of play, and you know the way he he played in some of those big games, you know the Arsenal game uh, when he's absolutely terrific. I know he didn't score a goal, but you know. He's what twenty one. He's doing everything else apart from scoring. Um, so I thought that was great. I mean, great. I know Dave Prentice from the Liverpool Echo has um, maybe in one of his more optimistic moments uh, likened him to a young Graham Sharp in the sense that you know Sharp maybe there's a cultishness, there's a long leggedness about him, um, an ability in the air. You know, Sharp he wasn't scoring. You know, 25 goals a season when he was 21. He took time. In fact, he needed Andy Gray to come in and you know teach him how to put himself about um, before he became the complete player. Um, so yeah, Calvin Lewin was was somebody that really gave me a lot of encouragement and just just enjoyed watching a you know young player who who had the opportunity and and, and took it uh, and hopefully you know long may it continue. Yeah, definitely. It was, it was interesting. He seems to have everything to his game apart from goals, and that's what that's the most vital thing for a striker. But if he can't add goals to his game, he will be unbelievable. He will, he will be unplayable on his day. So um, it'll be really interesting to see if that happens because he really has got the talents. And uh, yeah, you hear the head here first. Calvin Lewin is the next Graham Sharp. So uh, no, no. Um, Without putting the weight on his shoulders, we are really excited about the prospects of Dominic Calvert-Lewin, and um, we look forward to seeing next season whether he can develop his game even more, which I'm sure he can. You can definitely see the has been coached for, uh, by Duncan Ferguson. You can see the influence of Duncan Ferguson and his coaching on Calvert-Lewin. But if if he can add goals to his game, that really will be exciting to see what happens next season and beyond, because obviously he's still young as well. And we should we should definitely give him time and see if we can sign another striker to kind of. Play him off as well, so all the weight's not on his shoulders as well. So be interesting to see what happens next season. 
Yeah, although we, we didn't hear it here first. I nicked the line off Yeah, that's the one, yeah. Who nicked it off, who nicked it off Preno? But uh, yeah, well, well, yeah, day second. <laughs> there we go. Um, it's an interesting new addition to get people going. But um, as well, just to compare um, nowadays back to the 80s again, just because I love... I think it, that's... A lot of our fans are of a young age, but I think to relate back to that period, for people who don't remember it, we've probably got to compare um, back to things nowadays. Is there any of the current squad uh, obviously you've got to know the characters from that 80s team so well uh, as we've seen in that book and uh, as anyone else who wants to read it will see but do you think there's any any characters in this current squad that remind you of characters who were in that successful 80s team uh, I think we're still waiting for Ian for the leader I mean the one similarity maybe a collective similarity would be last season we saw a young team who were really struggling with confidence at one point, and, and you, I really thought they needed, you know, a, an old head, even you know, somebody like Troy Deeney who can sort of just make things difficult for the opposition and know how to win a game, yeah. you know, do the ugly things to win a game. There were times when I think they lacked that, and that was really, you know, that was the case with Everton in kind of 82, 83, where they they had this young team who were coming through, but they. You know, it was pretty touch and go whether Howard Kendall would, would remain manager. You know, he offered to resign at the end of '83 after I think after they lost three 0 the Wolves uh, around Christmas time, um, and he, he was pretty low. You know, the people wanted him out. The, the leaflets at a game and things were really, you know, uh, it was a it was a fine line. Um, but two players came in, Reed and Gray, um, who just really showed that group of players how to win. Uh, so whether we could, you know, that's what I'd like. I'd like somebody to come in, be it a, 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 an Andy Gray or a, a Peter Reid or a Tim Cahill, or I'd say Tim Cahill rather than Phil Neville, though Phil Neville did do an important job. But, you know, Cahill, somebody who can be a catalyst, be that player who will, you know, he'll strut his, he'll sort of stick his chest out and he will, you know, put a foot in and, and be a leader on the pitch. Um, I mean, do you think we've got one of them? A leader at the moment, I doubt it to be honest. I think we're probably going to have to go and buy one because there's not one there. Like you can put, the, I think we've seen what happens when you put the weight on someone like Tom Davis, who's so young, trying to forge his place in the team, and all of a sudden he's captain, and everyone's thinking he's he, he's going to be he's nominated for Golden Boy, and everyone thinks he's this prodigy. But he's he's a young lad, and he's he was kind of thrown into the team to, to fill, fill gaps a lot of the time, and I don't think he is that captain figure, and. I don't think we've got one. Maybe there's a few developing. Michael Key, maybe, but we don't know how long he's staying around. And there's a, there's a few coming through. Obviously, you've got the old guard of Seamus Coleman still there as well. I'm not sure if he's maybe a captain figure, but not a natural leader. Um, and obviously, Leighton Baines isn't a natural leader as well, but he's, he's the old guard, so to speak, at the moment in that team. But no, I don't think we have. I think we would have to go and buy a, a ready-made leader, but then to get them to specifically lead the group would be would be a difficult job really but that's something that hopefully Marcel Brand is, is looking at at the moment but um, yeah it'd be interesting to see how that works out but yeah um, going back to the book anyway what's it called um, what's your, what, who was your favourite person to interview I know you said you had to go to the south of France and stay a night with um, with Paul Powers um, which must have been a fantastic experience but who was your favourite out of the, all, the, all the players that you spoke to yeah, I, I don't. I mean, I don't have one particular favourite. They're all, they're all, you know, um, great in their own way. I mean, Neville Southall. I went down to his. Uh, he, he works in a in a school for kind of children excluded from mainstream education, and spent a morning with him at this school down in Ebervale in South Wales. And that was that was, you know, fascinating to see to see Nev in this completely different context that you know he lives in nowadays. Um, you know the. I think his football kind of banter is, you know, that dry sense of humour helps him now, you know, dealing in difficult situations with, with some kind of quite troubled uh, young people. Um, so that was a great day. Um, Paul Power, you know, just seeing uh, all, all the little trinkets he's kept. He's got a Paddington bird. That every, I didn't realise this. Every player in the FA Cup finals, you know, in the 70s and 80s used to get a Paddington uh, in the, the, the colour of the Basically Paddington, but you know, decked out in the the colours of, in his case, Manchester City with even the Umbro diamonds. Um, and he keeps all of this stuff. He's got you know pictures on the wall of of scoring against Everton for Man City in the 
in an FA Cup game, the quarter final. Um, but he, he was great company. Um, Adrian Heath, of course, um, as I mentioned, you know, a real enthusiast. Mark Higgins' story um, was um, very poignant. He was the captain who would have been Everton's most successful captain, but but for an injury. Um, and just to sit down and hear his story was, you know, extremely. Um, I don't know. It was quite emotional from his side, and a great chapter for the book. Paul Bracewell is the the book just come out in paperback, and we added the Paul Bracewell chapter because he he's another of these unsung heroes. Um, you know, he was the kind of the glue of, or the person who did the the I don't know the the unseen work in that mid that great midfield of the mid eighties. You know, with Peter Reid, uh, Trevor Stephen, Kevin Sheedy, and there's Bracewell who who was, you know, a real, really important player in kind of, I think Colin Harvey, who was the coach at the time um, and got Everton to play a pressing game. And he said Bracewell was the best player at doing that, at reading the opposition and stepping and coming away with the ball. Um, he had five in, five operations at Everton to try and get to the bottom of an injury. Um, and, you know, hearing that story, which he was out for 20 months um, and, uh, you know, Medical scans weren't what they used to be. It, it, he, he went to the States in the end of San Francisco. And, uh, you know, in the chapter, he, he retells the, the story of just how frustrated he was that some people at the club didn't actually believe he still had you know, a problem. They thought it was scar tissue. They thought it was a bit psychological. And yet, actually, part of his... Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not a medic here, but I think part of the, the ankle had chipped off and got stuck into his tibia or the other way around um, and it took a trip to the States and a scan you know to get to the bottom of this five operations later so that was fascinating um, one maybe the last possibly Colin Harvey in a way was another of my favourites because he you know I think I don't think there's a living Everton player or Everton man who's seen and experienced more than Colin um, and you know he's such a humble fellow um, you know he won the league as a player uh, he was, kept, you know, won the league as the right hand man for Howard, um, and you know, a, a, a really, really great fella. Yeah, it was, it was fantastic. It was kind of like um, you read through all those stories, and at the end, it was like the father of it all. I know Howard Kendall would have been up there as well, but obviously, unfortunately, he's passed away. But to hear Colin Harvey's story of it all, kind of as the brains behind it all, because he is the one who's he introduced that pressing game, as you said in the book, and um, and kind of. The, the playing style encapsulated that eighties team as well. I know we've um, I've mentioned most of the names, but I just for the for, for the viewers as well. I mentioned I'll read through the people who've been featured in the book. I didn't know that Bracewell was uh, added as part of the, this revised version, but I thought his his, his uh, chapter was very interesting, especially one the story. One of my favourite stories in the book was uh, I don't want to spoil too much. This book's dotted with absolute gems of a st- of stories, but um, one of my favourites was John and Bracewell when uh, John and Bracewell story you mentioned when. Uh, he'd been to several specialists who'd said there was nothing wrong with him, but he knew there was something wrong with him. And he asked the physio to uh, to write down and put in a hat uh, what was wrong with him. And um, and, and then he went off to the states, got it sorted, and got it, came back with it with this scan and found out, as you said, that was the problem. Um, so part of his ankle had snapped off and was embedded into his tibia. And then they opened the, the piece of paper that the physio had written what he thought was wrong with him, and it said fuck all. So that that was that was a brilliant story, but uh, it started with gems and. The, 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 the full list of these players is um, Mike Lyons, Kevin Ratcliffe, Kevin Richardson, Adrian Heath, Mark Higgins, Derek Monfield, Pat Vanden Howe, Paul Wilkinson, Paul Bracewell, Gary Lineker, Paul Power, Pat Nevin, Neville Southall and Colin Harvey to finish it off. So it's, a, it's an absolutely fantastic book. I took this on holiday um, while I was going to see my girlfriend who lives in Spain and I think I spent more time with the book than I did with my girlfriend so that might uh, not be in the best um, in terms of... Um, in terms of my girlfriend's point of view, but for me that was a uh, was what I wanted to do. It was encapsulating, to be honest, because I wanted to know more about Everton in the eighties and um, what's it called? It's kind of it brought it to life to me. And ever since I've read the book, I've been watching videos in YouTube of of those matches. I've been able to find full matches of of the semi final against Bayern Munich second leg at Goodison and epic Goodison moments like that in the final against Rapid Vienna as well. I found that and it just brings it to life. And I didn't know a lot and. Some of some of our viewers may be the same that you, whether you're a young uh, person who doesn't know a lot about Everton in the eighties, or whether one of our American viewers that the Jerry's brought over that doesn't know a lot about Everton in the eighties. It's just fantastic read to really bring it to life. I really do recommend it. But um, 
it's a great book. You should definitely give it a look. Here we go. Everton in the 1980s, is the player's stories, and it's just been fully revised and updated in paperback edition as well. So make sure you have a look at that. We'll have a few links in the description. But just to, just for you, Simon, as well, what are you working on at the moment? So what we can plug you for? I know you've got an excellent book as well about uh, the Italia 1990 uh, World Cup finals yeah, over there. Yeah. So that's a fantastic book. But what are you working on at the moment? Um, well, I, I'm, I'm a freelance journalist. Um, during the last season, I was doing a column actually with Big Neville, which has been a nice uh, offshoot of the book. Uh, did a column together for the eye paper. Um, currently, I'm uh, my next job will be well, I'm writing one of UEFA's technical reports uh, on the champ <laughs> the Champions League <laughs> season, which meant I had to uh, go and enjoy uh, the final in Madrid, um, which was an experience. Um, I'm, I'm doing the under 19s in Armenia with with UEFA next month. Um, which should be interesting um, to you know, just to see football in a completely different place. Um, so yeah, I do I do work for UEFA for their publications, and there's a new Champions League magazine starting soon, which um, I'm involved in. Um, plus, you know, my newspaper stuff with the Eye. Um, hopefully, another book sometime, you know, somewhere down the line. So we'll, we'll wait and see, see what happens with that. Um, but uh, but no, yeah, um, always busy. So. That would be fantastic. Looking forward to the next book. That would be. Interesting um, new project for us to look forward to. Anyway, we'll put Simon's Twitter in the in the in the graphic below his picture as well, so you can um you can have a look at check check what he's doing on Twitter all the time. Give him a follow and um give give, give us all a follow and um, subscribe to Taffy Blues. Thanks a lot for watching. Like like the uh, video and comment what you think. And um, please do give this excellent book a read because it really was a fantastic read. Brought it to life to me. One of Everton's most successful ever periods. Really brought it to life. So make sure you do give it a read. And thanks a lot for watching and joining us next time on the Toffee Blues. And of course, thanks to Simon for joining us as well. Thanks a lot. Thank you.